Hi friends, how are you guys doing tonight? Hello, hello, happy Sunday, the last day of the weekend before we all get back into our normal life routines. I hope your weekends were very nice. Um, as always, if the music's a little too loud, just let me know. The guys you were playing tackle football without pads. Oh gosh. Also, please forgive me. <clears throat> my procedure to get my na uh, nose cauterized on Tuesday is on Tuesday, but in the meantime, I've been getting a little bit of like, like nasal drip. So <clears throat> it's not like super gross or anything. It's just been kind of dripping. So I apologize. I'll be wiping my nose a little bit during this stream. Oh yay! I'm glad you caught the ball. Okay. All right. Okay. We we good. We good, boys and girls. Okay. Hello again. Today we will be reading chapters 5 through 8 of Why am I holding this up? Now it just looks like twins. Um, The Miserable Mill. Uh book number 4 of a series of unfortunate events. All the events have been quite unfortunate. Oh, thank you so much for that host, Terror. Hope you're having a wonderful night. Great to see you. Okay. Anyway. I'm going to go ahead and jump on in without further ado. Again, I apologize for the slight sniffles and wiping that will be happening due to my little nasal drip. I'm trying not to be disgusting about it. Um, but until they fix my nose up on Tuesday. I'm going to have to do this. So, anyway. Mm, this music, though. Is the If the music is distracting or too loud, please let me know so I can cut it down some more. But here we go. Ahem. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Chapter 5 In the days that followed, the Bodler orphans had pits in their stomach. In Sunny's case, it was understandable because when Klaus had divided up the peach, she had gotten the part with the pit. Normally, of course, one does not eat the pit part of the peach, but Sunny was very hungry and she liked to eat hard things, so the pit ended up in her stomach along with the parts of the fruit that you or I might find more suitable. But the pit in the Baudelaire's stomachs was not so much from the snack that Charles had given them, but from an overall feeling of doom. They were certain that Count Olaf was lurking nearby, like some predator waiting to pounce on the children when they weren't looking. So each morning, <clears throat> when Foreman Flacatona clanged his pots together to wake everyone up, the Baudelaire's took a good look at him to see if Count Olaf had taken his place. It would have been just like Count Olaf to put a white wig on his head and a surgical mask over his face and snatch the Baudelaire's right out of their bunk. But Florman Flacatono always had the same dark and beady eyes, which didn't look a thing like Count Olaf's shiny ones. And he always spoke in his rough, muffled voice, which was the opposite of the smooth, snarly voice of Count Olaf. When the children walked across the dirt-floored dirt floored courtyard to the lumber mill, they took a good look at their fellow employees. 
It would have been just like Count Olaf to get himself hired as an employee and snatch the orphans away while Foreman Flakatona wasn't looking. But although all the workers looked tired and sad and hungry, none of them looked evil or greedy or had such awful manners. And as the orphans performed the backbreaking labor of the lumber mill, the word backbreaking here means so difficult and tiring that it felt like the orphans' backs were breaking even though they actually weren't. They wondered if Count Olaf would use one of the enormous machines to somehow get his hands on their fortune, but that didn't seem to be the case either. After a few days of tearing the bark off the trees, the debarkers were put back in their corner and the giant pincher machine was turned off. Next, the workers had to pick up the barkless trees themselves one by one and hold them against the buzzing circular saw until it had sliced each tree into flat boards. The youngsters' arms were soon achy and covered in splinters from lifting all of the logs, but Count Olaf did not take advantage of their weakened arms to kidnap them. After a few days of sawing, Foreman Flacatona ordered Phil to start up the machine with an enormous ball of string inside. The machine wrapped the string around small bundles of boards and the employees had to gather around and tie the string into very complicated knots to hold the bundles together. The siblings' fingers were soon so sore that they could scarcely hold the coupons they were given each day, but Count Olaf did not try to force them to surrender their fortune. Day after dreary day went by, and although the children were convinced that he must be somewhere nearby, Count Olaf simply did not show up. It was very puzzling. It's very puzzling, Violet said one day during their gum break. Count Olaf is simply nowhere to be found. I know, Klaus said, rubbing his right thumb, which was the sorest. That building looks like his tattoo, and so does that book cover, but Count Olaf himself hasn't shown his face. Eland, Sunny said thoughtfully. She probably meant something like, it certainly is perplexing. Violet snapped her fingers, frowning because it hurt. I've thought of something, she said. Klaus, you just said he hasn't shown his face. Maybe he's Sir, in disguise. We can't tell what Sir really looks like because of that cloud of smoke. Count Olaf could have dressed in a green suit and taken up smoking just to fool us. I thought of that too, Klaus said, but he's much shorter than Count Olaf, and I don't know how you can disguise yourself as a much shorter person. Chorn, Sonny pointed out, which meant something like, and his voice is nothing like Count Olaf's. That's true, Violet said, and gave Sonny a small piece of wood that was sitting on the floor. Because babies should not have gum, Sonny's older siblings gave her these small tree scraps during the lunch break. Sonny did not eat the wood, of course, but she chewed on it and pretended it was a carrot or an apple or a beef and cheese enchilada, all of which she loved. It might just be that Count Olaf hasn't found us, Klaus said. After all, Paltryville is in the middle of nowhere. It could take him years to track us down. Pelly, Sonny exclaimed, which meant something like, but that doesn't explain the eye-shaped building or the cover of the book. Those things could just be coincidence, Violet admitted. We're so scared of Count Olaf that maybe we're thinking we're seeing him everywhere. Maybe he won't show up. Maybe we really are safe here. That's the spirit, said Phil, who'd been sitting near them all this time. Look on the bright side. Lucky Smell's Lumber Mill might not be your favorite place, but at least there's no sign of this Olaf guy you keep talking about. This might turn out to be the most fortunate part of your lives. I admire your optimism, Klaus said, smiling at Phil. Me too, Violet said. Tenpa, Sunny agreed. That's the spirit, Phil said again and stood up to stretch his legs. The Baudelaire orphans nodded but looked at one another out of the corners of their eyes. It was true that Count Olaf hadn't shown up, or at least he hadn't shown up yet, but their situation was far from fortunate. They had to wake up to the clanging of pots and be ordered around by Foreman Flacatono. They only had gum, or in Sonny's case, imaginary enchiladas, for lunch. And worst of all, working in the lumber mill was so exhausting that they didn't have the energy to do anything else. Even though she was near complicated machines every day, Violet hadn't even thought about inventing something for a very long time. Even though Klaus was free to visit Charles's library whenever he wanted to, he hadn't even glanced at any of the three books. And even though there were plenty of hard things around to bite, Sunny hadn't closed her mouth around more than a few of them. The children missed studying reptiles with Uncle Monty. They missed living over Lake Lacrimose with Aunt Josephine, and most of all, that, of course, they missed living with their parents, which was where, after all, they truly belonged. Well, Violet said after a pause, we'll only have to work here for a few years. Then I'll be of age and we can use some of the Baudelaire fortune. I'd like to build an inventing studio for myself, perhaps over Lake Lacrimose, where Aunt Josephine's house used to be, so we can always remember it. And I'd like to build a library, Klaus said, that would be open to the public. And I've always hoped we could buy back Uncle Monty's reptile collection and take care of all those reptiles. Dolk, Sonny shrieked, which meant, and I could be a dentist. What in the world does Dolk mean? The orphans looked up and saw that Charles had come into the lumber mill. He was smiling at them and taking something out of his pocket. Hello, Charles, Violet said. It's nice to see you. What have you been up to? Ironing Sir's shirts, Charles answered. 
He has a lot of shirts, and he's too busy to iron them himself, he says. I've been meaning to come by, but the ironing took a long time. I brought you some beef jerky. I was afraid to take more than a little bit, because Sir would know that it's missing, but here you go. Thank you very much, Klaus said politely. We'll share this with the other employees. Well, okay, Charles said, but last week they got a coupon for 30% off beef jerky, so they probably bought plenty of it. Maybe they did, Violet said, knowing full well there was no way any of the workers could afford beef jerky. Charles, we've been meaning to ask you about one of the books in your library. You know the one with the eye on the cover? Where did you... Violet's question was interrupted by the sound of Foreman Flacatono's pots being banged together. Back to work, he shouted. Back to work. We have to finish tying the bundles today, so there's no time for chit-chat. I would just like to talk to these children for a few more minutes, Foreman Flacatono, Charles said. Surely we can extend the lunch break just a little bit. Absolutely not, Foreman Flacatono said, striding over to the orphans. I have my orders from Sir, and I intend to carry them out. Unless you'd like to tell Sir that... Uh, oh, no, 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 Charles said quickly, backing away from Foreman Flacatono. I don't think that's necessary. Good, the foreman said shortly. Now get up, midgets. Lunch is over. The children sighed and stood up. They had long ago given up trying to convince Foreman Flacatono that they weren't midgets. They waved goodbye to Charles and walked slowly to the waiting bundle of boards with Foreman Flacatono walking behind them. And at that moment, one of the children had a trick played on him, which I hope has never been played on you. This trick involves sticking your foot out in front of a person who is walking, so the person trips and falls to the ground. A policeman did it to me once when I was carrying a crystal ball belonging to a gypsy fortune teller who never forgave me for tumbling to the ground and shattering her ball into hundreds of pieces. It is a mean trick and it is easy to do and I'm sorry to say that Foreman Flacatono did it to Klaus right at this moment. Klaus fell right to the ground of the lumber mill, his glasses falling off his face and skittering over to the bundle of boards. Hey, Klaus said, you tripped me. One of the most annoying aspects of this sort of trick is that the person who does it usually pretends not to know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about, Foreman Flacatono said. Klaus was too annoyed to argue. He stood up and Violet walked over to fetch his glasses, but when she leaned over to pick them up, she saw at once that something was very, very wrong. Rote up, Sunny shrieked, and she spoke the truth. When Klaus's glasses had skittered across the room, they had scraped against the floor and hit the boards rather hard. Violet picked the glasses up and they looked like a piece of modern sculpture a friend of mine made long ago. This sculpture was called Twisted, Cracked, and Hopelessly Broken. My brother's glasses, Violet cried. They're twisted and cracked. They're hopelessly broken and he can scarcely see anything without them. Too bad for you, Foreman Flacatono said, shrugging at Klaus. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Klaus said. He needs a replacement pair, Foreman Flacatono. A child could see that. Not me, Klaus said, because I can scarcely see anything. Well, take my arm, Charles said. There's no way you can work in a lumber mill without being able to see what you're doing. I'll take you to the eye doctor right away. Oh, thank you, Violet said, relieved. Is there an eye doctor nearby? Klaus asked. Oh, yes, Charles replied. The closest one is Dr. Orwell, who wrote that book you were asking me about. Dr. Orwell's office is just outside the doors of the mill. I'm sure you noticed it on your way here. It's made to look like a giant eye. Come on, Klaus. Oh, no, Charles, Violet said. Don't take him there. Charles cupped a hand to his ear. What'd you say? He shouted. Phil had flipped the switch on the string machine, and the ball of string had begun to spin inside its cage, making a loud whirring sound as the employees got back to work. That building has the mark of Count Olaf, Klaus shouted. But Foreman Flacatono had begun to clang his pots together, and Charles shook his head to indicate he couldn't hear. Your yar, Sonny shrieked, but Charles just shrugged and led Klaus out of the mill. The two Baudelaire sisters looked at one another. The whirring sound continued and Foreman Flacatono kept on clanging his pots, but that wasn't the loudest sound the two girls heard. Louder than the machine, louder than the pots, was the sound of their own furiously beating hearts as Charles took their brother away. End of chapter 5. <laughs> and the children were right in real life. Never bothered again. Oh, you almost fell and then laughed at their failure.
twisty, cracked, and hopelessly broken was my nickname in high school after I tried dancing. <laughs> Thank you. All right, moving on. Chapter six. I tell you, you have nothing to worry about, Phil said as Violet and Sunny picked at their casserole. It was dinner time, but Klaus had still not returned from Dr. Orwell's and the young Baudelaire women were worried sick. After work while walking across the dirty courtyard with their fellow employees, Violet and Sunny had peered, peered worriedly at the wooden gate that led out to Poultryville and were dismayed to see no sign of Klaus. When they arrived at the dormitory, Violet and Sunny looked out at the window to watch for him, and they were so anxious that it took them several minutes to realize that the window was not a real one, but one drawn on the blank wall with a ballpoint pen. Then they went out and sat on the doorstep, looking out at the empty courtyard until Phil called them into supper. And now it was getting on toward bedtime, and not only had their brother still not returned, but Phil was insisting they had nothing to worry about. I think we do, Phil, Violet said. I think we do have something to worry about. Klaus has been gone all afternoon, and Sonny and I are worried that something might have happened to him. Something awful. Besser, Sonny agreed. I know that doctors can seem scary to young children, Phil said, but doctors are your friends, and they can't hurt you. Violet looked at Phil and saw that their conversation would go nowhere. You're right, she said tiredly, even though he was quite wrong. As anyone who's ever been to a doctor knows, doctors are not necessarily your friends any more than mail deliverers are your friends, or butchers are your friends, or refrigerator repair people are your friends. A doctor is a man or woman whose job it is to make you feel better. That's all, and if you've ever had a shot, you know that the statement, doctors can't hurt you, is simply absurd. Violet and Sunny, of course, were worried that Dr. Orwell had some connection with Count Olaf. Not that their brother would get a shot, but it was useless to try to explain such things to an optimist. So they merely picked at their casserole and waited for their brother until it was time for bed. Dr. Orwell must have fallen behind in his appointments, Phil said, as, Do as Violet and Sunny tucked themselves into the bottom bunk. His waiting room must be absolutely full. Suski, Sunny said sadly, which meant something along the lines of, I hope so, Phil. Phil smiled at the two Baudelaire's and turned out the lights in the dormitory. The employees whispered to each other for a few minutes and then were quiet, and before too long, Violet and Sunny were surrounded by the sound of snores. The children did not sleep, of course, but stared out into the dark room with a growing feeling of dismay. Sunny made a squeaky, sad noise like the closing of a door, and Violet took her sister's fingers, which were sore from tying knots all day, and blew on them gently. But even as the Baudelaire fingers felt better, the Baudelaire sisters did not. They lay together on the bunk and tried to imagine where Klaus could be and what was happening to him. But one of the worst things about Count Olaf is that his evil ways are so despicable that it is impossible to imagine what would be up his sleeve next. Count Olaf had done so many horrible deeds all to get his hands on the Baudelaire fortune that Violet and Sunny could scarcely bear to think what might be happening to their brother. The evening grew later and later and the two siblings began to imagine more and more terrible things that could be happening to Klaus while they lay helpless in the dormitory. Sintim Kunu, Sunny whispered finally and Violet nodded. They had to go and look for him. The expression quiet as mice is a puzzling one because mice can often be very noisy. So people who are being quiet as mice may in fact be squeaking and scrambling around. The expression quiet as mimes is a more appropriate one because mimes are people who perform theatrical routines without making a sound. Mimes are annoying and embarrassing, but they are much quieter than mice, so quiet as mimes is a more proper way to describe how Violet and Sunny got up from their bunk, tiptoed across the dormitory, and walked out into the night. There was a full moon that night, and the children gazed for a moment at the quiet courtyard. The moonlight made the dirt floor look as strange and eerie as the surface of the moon. Violet picked Sunny up, and the two of them crossed the courtyard toward the heavy wooden gate leading out of the lumber mill. The only sound was the soft shuffling of Violet's feet. The orphans could not remember when they had been in a place that felt so quiet and still, which is why the sudden creaking sound made them jump in surprise. The creaking sound was as noisy as mice and seemed to be coming from straight ahead. 
Violet and Sunny stared out into the gloom, and with another creak, the wooden gate swung open and revealed the short figure of a person walking slowly toward them. Klaus, Sunny said, for one of the few regular words she used was the name of her brother. And to her relief, Violet saw that it was indeed Klaus who was walking toward them. He had on a new pair of glasses that looked just like his old ones, except they were so new that they shone in the moonlight. He gave his sisters a dazed and distant smile as if they were people he did not know so well. Klaus, we were so worried about you, Violet said, hugging her brother as he reached them. You were gone for so long. Whatever happened to you? I don't know, Klaus said so quietly that his sisters had to lean forward to hear him. I can't remember. Did you see Count Olaf? Violet asked. Was Dr. Orwell working with him? Did they do anything to you? I don't know, Klaus said, shaking his head. I remember breaking my glasses, and I remember Charles taking me to the I-shaped building, but I don't remember anything else. I scarcely remember where I am right now. Klaus, Violet said firmly, you are at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill in Paltryville. Surely you remember that. Klaus did not answer. He merely looked at his sisters with wide, wide eyes as if they were an interesting aquarium or a parade. Klaus? Violet asked. I said, you are at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Klaus still did not answer. He must be very tired, Violet said to Sunny. Leibu, Sunny said doubtfully. You'd better get to bed, Klaus, Violet said. Follow me. At last Klaus spoke. Yes, sir, he said quietly. Sir, Violet re repeated. I'm not a sir, I'm your sister. But Klaus was silent once more and Violet gave up. Still carrying Sunny, she walked back toward the dormitory and Klaus shuffled behind her. The moon shone on his new glasses and his steps made little clouds of dirt, but he didn't say a word. Quiet as mimes, the Baudelaire's walked back into the dormitory and tiptoed to their bunk bed. But when they reached it, Klaus merely stood nearby and stared at his two siblings as if he'd forgotten how to go to bed. Lie down, Klaus, Violet said gently. Yes, sir, Klaus replied and lay down on the bottom bunk, still staring at his sisters. Violet sat on the edge of the bunk and removed Klaus's shoes, which he'd forgotten to take off, but it seemed he didn't even notice. We'll discuss things in the morning, Violet whispered. In the meantime, Klaus, try and get some sleep. Yes, sir, Klaus said and immediately shut his eyes. In a second, he was fast asleep. Violet and Sunny watched the way his mouth quivered, just as it had always done when he was asleep, ever since he was a tiny baby. It was a relief to have Klaus back with them, of course, but the Baudelaire sisters did not feel relieved, not one bit. They had never seen their brother act so strangely. For the rest of the night, Violet and Sunny huddled together on the top bunk, peering down and watching Klaus sleep. No matter how much they looked at him, it still felt like their brother had not returned. End of chapter 6 I too have been wildly coyoted by wall drawn opening. But your doctors are certainly not your friend. <laughs> An interesting aquarium. That's how I want my stairs to be. Just at first, I was like, "Man, semi, that sounds really sad." But then I realized you were quoting a song. I'm going to wipe my nose. Please pardon me. Oh, what? Hello. Hello. Readjust that. Two more chapters to go. Hello, Homestyle Chillin'. Yo, I am reading some sick books. Um, I've been going through the Series of Unfortunate Events series by Lemony Snicket. I'm bu on book number four now. So welcome to the channel. I hope you are having a great night. Um, feel free to kick back relax and uh grab yourself a cup of coffee or hot cocoa or i don't know whatever you like and enjoy if you like um please excuse my nose wiping uh been a a weird week for me including having a busted blood vessel in my nose <laughs> uh sorry if that's tmi all i'm good i'm cool and everything don't like don't don't be worried for me but 
or oxygen. Oh, if you like ox a cup, get yourself a nice cold cup cup of oxygen. Sweet. You're going to go make some cocoa. Enjoy that cocoa. I'm about to jump into chapter 7 here. Cool. All right. Here we go. Chapter 7. If you have ever had a miserable experience, then you've probably had it said to you that you will feel better in the morning. This, of course, is utter nonsense because a miserable experience remains a miserable experience even on the loveliest of mornings. For instance, if it were, were your birthday and a wart removal cream was the only present you received, someone might tell you to get a good night's sleep and wait until morning. But in the morning, the tube of wart removal cream would still be sitting there next to your uneaten birthday cake and you would feel as miserable as ever. My chauffeur once told me that I would feel better in the morning, but when I woke up, the two of us were still on a tiny island surrounded by man-eating crocodiles, and as I'm sure you can understand, I didn't feel any better about it. And so it was with the Baudelaire orphans. As soon as Foreman Flacatono began clanging his pots together, Klaus opened his eyes and asked where in the world he was, and Violet and Sunny did not feel better at all. What is wrong with you, Klaus? Violet asked. Klaus looked at Violet carefully as if they'd met once years ago and he'd forgotten her name. I don't know, he said. I'm having trouble remembering things. What happened yesterday? That's what we want to ask you, Klaus, Violet said, but she was interrupted by their rude employer. Get up, you lazy midgets, Foreman Flacatono shouted, walking over to the Baudelaire bunk and clanging his pots together again. The Lucky Smells Lumber Mill has no time for dawdling. Get out of bed this instant and go straight to work. Klaus's eyes grew very wide and he sat up in bed. In an instant, he was walking toward the door of the the door of the dormitory without a word to his sisters. That's the spirit, Foreman Flacatono said and clanged his pots together again. Now everybody, on to the lumber mill. Violet and Sunny looked at one another and hurried to follow their brother and the other employees, but Violet took one step and something made her stop. On the floor next to the Baudelaire bunk were Klaus's shoes, which she had removed the night before. Klaus had not even put them on before walking outside. His shoes, Violet said, picking them up. Klaus, you forgot your shoes. She ran after him, but Klaus did not even look back. By the time Violet reached the door, her brother was walking barefoot across the courtyard. Grummel? Sonny called after him, but he did not answer. Come on, children, Phil said. Let's hurry to the lumber mill. Phil, there's something wrong with my brother, Violet said, while watching Klaus open the door of the lumber mill and lead the other employees inside. He scarcely says a word to us, but he doesn't seem to remember anything. And look, he didn't put on his shoes this morning. We'll look on the bright side, Phil said. We're supposed to finish tying today, and next we do the stamping. Stamping is the easiest part of the lumber business. I don't care about the lumber business, Violet cried. Something is wrong with Klaus. Let's not make trouble, Violet, Phil said, and walked off toward the lumber mill. Violet and Sunny looked at one another helplessly. They had no choice but to follow Phil across the courtyard and into the mill. Inside, the string machine was already whirring, and the stories were beginning to tie up the last few batches of boards. Violet and Sunny hurried to get a place next to Klaus, and for the next few hours they tied knots and tried to talk to their brother. But it was difficult to speak to him over the whirring of the string machine and the clanging of Foreman Flacatono's pots, and Klaus never answered them. Finally, the last pile of boards was tied together and Phil turned off the string machine and everybody received their gum. Violet and Sunny each grabbed one of Klaus's arms and dragged their barefooted brother to a corner of the mill to talk to him. Klaus! Klaus, please talk to me! Violet cried. You're frightening us. You've got to tell us what Dr. Orwell did so we can help you. Klaus simply stared at his sister with widened eyes. Ishan! Sonny shrieked. Klaus did not say a word. He did not even put his gum into his mouth. Violet and Sonny sat down beside him, confused and frightened, and put their arms around their brother as though they were afraid he was floating away. There, they sat there like that, a heap of Baudelaire's, until Foreman Flacatono clanked his pots together to signal the end of break. Stampin' time, Foreman Flacatono said, pushing his stringy white wig out of his eyes. Everybody line up for stampin'. And you, he said, pointing to Klaus, you, you lucky midget, will be operating the machine. Come over here so I can give you your instructions. Yes, sir, Klaus said in a quiet voice, and his sisters gasped in surprise. It was the first time he had spoken since they were up in the dormitory since they were in the dormitory. Without another word, he stood up, disentangled himself from his siblings, and walked toward Foreman Flacatono while his sisters looked on amazedly. 
Violet turned to her baby sister and brushed a small scrap of string out of her hair, something her mother used to do all the time. The eldest Baudelaire remembered, as she had remembered so many times, the promise she had made to her parents when Sunny was born. You are the eldest Baudelaire child, her parents had said, and as the eldest, it will always be your responsibility to look after your younger siblings. Promise us that you will always watch out for them and make sure they don't get into trouble. Violet knew, of course, that her parents had never guessed when they told her this, that the sort of trouble her siblings would get into would be so ostentatiously, a word which here means really, really horrendous, but still she felt as if she'd let her parents down. Klaus was clearly in trouble, and Violet could not shake the feeling that it was her responsibility to get him out of this. Foreman Flacatono whispered something to Klaus, who walked slowly over to the machine covered in smokestacks and began to operate its controls. Foreman Flacatono nodded to Klaus and clanged his pots together again. Let the stamping begin, he said in his terrible muffled voice. The Baudelaire's had no idea what For Foreman Flacatono meant by stamping, and thought maybe it involved jumping up and down on the boards for some reason, like stamping on ants, but it turned out to be more like stamping a library book. The workers would lift a bundle of boards and place it on a special mat, and the machine would bring its huge flat stone down on top of the boards with a thunderous stamp, leaving a label in red ink that read Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Then everyone had to blow on, it, blow on the stamp so it dried quickly. Violet and Sunny couldn't help wondering if people who would make their houses out of these boards would mind having the name of the lumber mill written on the walls of their homes, but more important, they couldn't help wondering how Klaus knew how to work the stamping machine and why Foreman Flacatona was having their brother at the controls instead of Phil or one of the other employees. You see, Phil told the Baudelaire sisters from across a bundle of boards, there's nothing wrong with Klaus. He's working the machine perfectly. You spent all that time worrying for nothing. Stamp. Maybe, Violet said doubtfully, blowing on the M in lumber mill. And I told you that stamping was the easiest part of the lumber mill industry, Phil said. Stamp! Your lips get a little sore from all the blowing, but that's all. Wero, Sunny said, which meant something like that's true, but I'm still worried about Klaus. That's the spirit, said Phil, misunderstanding her. I told you that if you just looked on the bright side, stamp, crash, ah! Phil fell to the floor in mid-sentence his face pale and sweaty. Of all the terrible noises to be heard at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, this one was the most terrible by far. The thunderous stamping sound had been cut off by a wrenching crash and a piercing shriek. The stamping machine had gone terribly wrong, and the huge flat stone had not been brought down where it was supposed to be brought down on the bundle of boards. Most of the stone had been brought down on the string machine, which was now hopelessly smashed, but part of it had been brought down on Phil's leg. Foreman Flacatono dropped his pots and ran over to the controls of the stamping machine, pushing the dazed Klaus aside. With a flip of the switch, he brought the stone up again, and everyone gathered around to see the damage. The cage part of the string machine was split open like an egg, and the string had become completely entwined and entangled. And I simply cannot describe the grotesque and unnerving sight, the words grotesque and unnerving here mean twisted, tangled, stained, and gory, of poor Phil's leg. It made Violet and Sunny's stomachs turn to gaze upon it, but Phil looked up and gave them a weak smile. Well, he said, this isn't uh, uh, too bad. Uh, my left leg is broken, but at least I'm right-legged, so that's pretty fortunate. Gee, one of the other employees murmured. I thought he'd say something more along the lines of, ah, my leg, my leg, my leg. <laughs> <laughs> if someone could just help me get back to my f get if someone could just help me get to my foot phil said i'm sure that i can get back to work don't be ridiculous violet said you need to go to a hospital yes phil another worker said we have those coupons from last month 50 percent off a cast at the ahab memorial hospital two of us will chip in and get your leg all fixed up i'll call for an ambulance right away Phil smiled. That's very kind of you, he said. This is a disaster, Foreman Flacatono shouted. This is the worst accident in the history of the lumber mill. No, no, Phil said. It's fine. I, n I never really liked my left leg much anyway. Not your leg, you overgrown midget, Foreman Flacatono said impatiently. The string machine, those cost an inordinate amount of money. What does inordinate mean, somebody asked. It means many things, Klaus said, suddenly blinking. It can mean irregular, it can mean immoderate, it can mean disorderly. 
but in the case of money, it is more likely to mean excessive. Foreman Flakatono means that that string machine costs a lot of money. The two Baudelaire sisters looked at one another and almost laughed in relief. Klaus! Violet cried. You're defining things! Klaus looked at his sisters and gave them a sleepy smile. I guess I am, he said. No, Jimu! Sunny shrieked, which meant something along the lines of, You appear to be back to normal. And she was right. Klaus blinked again and then looked at the mess he had caused. What happened here? He asked, frowning. Phil, what happened to your leg? Oh, it's perfectly all right, Phil said, wincing in pain as he tried to move. It's just a little sore. You mean you don't remember what happened? Violet asked. What happened when? Klaus asked, frowning. Why, look, I'm not wearing any shoes. Well, I certainly remember what happened, Foreman Flakatono shouted, pointing at Klaus. You smashed our machine. I will tell Sir about this right away. You've put a complete halt to the stamping process. Nobody will earn a single coupon today. That's not fair, Violet shouted. It was an accident, and Klaus should have never been put in charge of that machine. He didn't know how to use it. Well, he'd better learn, Foreman Flakatono said. Now pick up my pots, Klaus. Klaus went over to pick up the pots, but halfway there, Foreman Flakatono stuck his foot out, playing the same trick he'd played the previous day, and I am sorry to tell you that it worked just as well. Again, Klaus fell right to the ground of the lumber mill, and again, his glasses fell off his face and skittered over to the bundle of boards, and worst of all, once again, they became all twisted and cracked and hopelessly broken like my friend Titania's sculptures. My glasses! Klaus cried. My glasses are broken again! Violet got a funny feeling in her stomach all quivery and slithery as if she'd eaten snakes, rather than gum during the lunch break. Are you sure? She asked Klaus. Are you sure you can't wear them? I'm sure, Klaus said miserably, holding them up for Violet to see. Well, 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 Foreman Flakatono said. How careless of you. I guess you're due for another appointment with Dr. Orwell. We don't want to bother him, Violet said quickly. So if you give me just some basic supplies, I'm sure I can build some glasses myself. No, no. The foreman said, his surgical mask curling into a frown. You'd better leave optometry to the expert. Say goodbye to your brother. No, Violet said desperately. She thought again of the promise she had made to her parents. We'll take him. Sonny and I will bring him to Dr. Orwell. Derek, Sonny shrieked, which clearly meant something along the lines of, if we can't prevent him from going to Dr. Orwell, at least we can go with him. Well, all right, said foreman Flacatono, and his beady little eyes grew even darker than usual. That's a good idea, come to think of it. Why don't all three of you go see Dr. Orwell? End of chapter seven. Woo, you guys started talking a lot. The canisters of the stuff. What does that mean? If you mistook the wart removal cream as a tube of icing for your cake, it'll be a miserable morning. <laughs> I look forward to Klaus as a robot reveal. <laughs> oh gosh, heartless shroom. Hello. I do think I would look at the bright side of things. Yeah, like, that's why I started laughing, because the Spongebob guy, that's all I could think is the Spongebob guy. My leg! <laughs> Bye, Semi. Thanks for being here. I can't see anything without my glasses. Yeah, Klaus is Velma. Oh, the canisters of oxygen. Got it. Do I have a schedule for the books? Um, so with my, uh, with the job that I have, I have a different schedule, work schedule every week, which is unfortunate. So I don't have a stream schedule. However, I do have a book schedule. Um, I'm always um doing book streams along with game streams um so i've been going through this series as well as reading some nancy drew books so i do like a series of unfortunate events book and then a nancy drew book and then back to a series of unfortunate events and then back to nancy drew and so on and so forth i'll do that until um 
this series is over. This series will be over before the Nancy Drew stuff. Um, and then I don't know what I'll read after that. We'll see. But um, so uh, book stream is every other stream that I do. I wish that I could tell you the dates and times of those, but they kind of just have to happen. So like the next stream I do after tonight will be a game stream and then we'll come back to the book and then game and then book and then game and then book. And hopefully that makes sense. Oh, thank you so much for that follow homestyle chill. And I appreciate that. Um, so welcome to the channel. Officially, my name is V. It's really nice to have you here. Um, I hope you enjoy your time here. Um, feel free to call me V or Victoria or Tori um, or anything else really <laughs> as long not as long as it's not Vicky that's the one nickname I don't really like um, so but yeah yeah thank you so much for that follow um, I do do book streams often in between those game streams so just keep an eye out on your emails I guess or if you have live notifications and when I go live um, you'll know that it's a book stream if it's every other stream so hopefully that kind of clears up some of your questions but anyway. Okay. All right. We got one more chapter for tonight. One more chapter for tonight. Chapter eight. <clears throat> I like this song. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Chapter 8. The Baudelaire orphan stood outside the gates of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill and looked at an ambulance rushing past them as it took Phil to the hospital. They looked at the chewed up gum letters of the Lumber Mill sign and they looked down at the cracked pavement of Paltryville Street. In short, they looked everywhere but at the I-shaped building. We don't have to go, Violet said. We could run away. We could hide until the next train arrived to take it as far as possible. We know how to work in a lumber mill now so that we could get some jobs in some other town. But what if he found us, Klaus said, squinting at his sister. Who would protect us from Count Olaf if we were all by ourselves? We could protect ourselves, Violet replied. How can we protect ourselves, Klaus asked, when one of us is a baby and another one can barely see. We've protected ourselves before, Violet said. Just barely, Klaus replied. We've just barely escaped from Count Olaf each time. We can't run away and try to get along by ourselves without glasses. We have to go see Dr. Orwell and hope for the best. Sunny gave a little shriek of fear. Violet, of course, was too old to shriek instead of, except in emergency situations, but she was too old. She was not too old to be frightened. We don't know what will happen for us inside there, she said, looking at the black door and the eye's pupil. Think, Klaus, try to think. What happened to you when you went in there? I don't know, Klaus said miserably. I remember trying to tell Charles not to take me to the eye doctor, but he kept telling me that doctors were my friends and not to be frightened. Ha! Sonny shrieked, which meant, ha! And then what do you remember? Violet asked. Klaus closed his eyes and thought, I wish I could tell you, but it's like that part of my brain has been wiped clean. It's like I was asleep from the moment I walked into that building until right there at the lumber mill. But you weren't asleep, Violet said, and you were walking around like a zombie, and then you caused that accident and hurt poor Phil. But I don't remember those things, Klaus said. It's as if I... His voice trailed off and he stared into space for a moment. Klaus? Violet asked worriedly. It's as if I was hypnotized, Klaus said finally. He looked at Violet and then at Sunny, and his sisters could see he was figuring something else. Of course. Hypnosis would explain everything. I thought hypnosis was only in scary movies, Violet said. No, no, Klaus answered. I read the Encyclopedia Hypnotica just last year. It described all these famous cases of hypnosis throughout history. There was an ancient Egyptian king who was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to do was shout Ramses, and the king would perform chicken imitations, even though he was in front of the royal court. That's very interesting, Violet said, but a Chinese merchant who lived during the, during the Ling dynasty was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to do was shout Mail, and the merchant would play the violin, even though he'd never even seen one before. Those are amazing stories, Violet said, but... A man who lived in England in the 1920s was hypnotized. All the hypnotists had to do was shout Bloomsbury, and he suddenly became a brilliant writer, even though he couldn't even read. Maisie, Sonny shrieked, which probably meant we don't have time to hear all these stories, Klaus. Klaus grinned. 
I'm sorry, he said, but it was a very interesting book, and I'm pleased it's coming in handy now. Well, what did the book say about how to stop yourself from being hypnotized? Violet asked. Klaus's grin faded. Nothing, he said. Nothing, Violet repeated. An entire encyclopedia about hypnosis and nothing about it at all? If it, if it did, I didn't read any of it. I thought the parts about the famous hypnosis cases were the most interesting, so I read those, but I skipped some of the boring parts of the book. For the first time since they had walked out of the gates of the lumber mill, the Baudelaire orphans looked at the I-shaped building, and the building looked back at them. To Klaus, of course, Dr. Orwell's office looked just like a big blur, but to his sisters it looked like trouble. The round door painted black to resemble the pupil of the eye looked like a deep and endless hole, and the children felt as if they were going to fall into it. I'm never skipping the boring parts of a book again, Klaus said, and walked cautiously toward the building. You're not going inside? Violet said incredulously, a word which here means in a tone of voice to indicate Klaus was being foolish. What else can we do? Klaus said quietly. He began to feel along the side of the building to find the door, and at this point in the story of the Baudelaire orphans, I would like to interrupt for a moment and answer a question I'm sure you're probably asking yourself. It, it, is, impor it is an important question, one of which many, many people have asked many, many times in many, many places all over the world. The Baudelaire orphans have asked it, of course. Mr. Poe has asked it. I have asked it. My beloved Beatrice, before her untimely death, asked it, although she asked it too late. The question is, where is Count Olaf? If you've been following the story of these three orphans since the very beginning, then you know that Count Olaf is always lurking around these poor children, plotting and scheming to get his hands on the Baudelaire fortune. Within days of the orphans' arrival at a new place, Count Olaf and his nefarious assistants, the word nefarious here means Baudelaire hating, are usually on the scene, sneaking around and committing dastardly deeds. And yet, so far, he has been nowhere to be found. So as the three youngsters reluctantly head toward Dr. Orwell's office, I know you must be asking yourself where in the world this despicable villain can be. The answer is, very nearby. Violet and Sunny walked to the I-shaped building and helped their brother up the steps to the door, but before they could open it, the pupil swung open to reveal a person in a long white coat with a name tag reading Dr. Orwell. Dr. Orwell was a tall woman with blonde hair pulled back from her head and fashioned into a tight, tight bun. She had big black boots on her feet and was holding a long black cane with a shiny red jewel on the top. Why, hello, Klaus! Dr. Orwell said, nodding formally at the Baudelaire's. I didn't expect to see you back so soon. Don't tell me that you broke your glasses again. Unfortunately, yes, Klaus said. That's too bad, Dr. Orwell said. But you're in luck. We have very few appointments today, so come on in and I'll do all the necessary tests. The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another nervously. This wasn't what they had expected at all. They expected Dr. Orwell to be a much more sinister figure. Count Olaf in disguise, for instance, or one of his terrifying associates. They expected that they would be snatched inside the I-shaped building and perhaps never return. Instead, Dr. Orwell was a professional-looking woman who was politely inviting them inside. Come on, she said, showing the way with her black cane. Surely my receptionist will made some cookies that you girls can eat in the waiting room while I make Klaus's glasses. It won't take nearly as long as it did yesterday. Will Klaus be hypnotized? Violet demanded. Hypnotized? Dr. Orwell repeated, smiling. <clears throat> Goodness, no. Hypnos hypnosis is only in scary movies. The children, of course, knew this was not true, but she they figured if Dr. Orwell thought it was true, then she probably wasn't a hypnotist. Cautiously, they stepped inside the I-shaped building and followed Dr. Orwell down a hallway decorated with medical certificates. This way to the office, she said. Klaus tells me he's quite a reader. D do you two read as well? Oh, yes, Violet said. She was beginning to relax. We read whenever we can. Have you ever encountered, Dr. Orwell said, in your reading? The expression, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Tuzmo, Sunny replied, which meant something along the lines of, I don't believe so. I haven't read too many books about flies, Violet admitted. Well, the expression doesn't really have to do with flies, Dr. Orwell explained. It's just a fancy way of saying that you're more likely to get what you want by acting in a sweet way, like honey, rather than in a distasteful way, like vinegar. That's interesting, Klaus said, wondering why Dr. Orwell was bringing it up. I suppose you're wondering why I'm bringing it up, Dr. Orwell said, pausing in front of a door marked waiting room. But I think it will all be clear to you in just a moment. Now, Klaus, follow me to the office and you girls can wait in the waiting room through this door. The children hesitated. It will just be a few moments, Dr. Orwell said and patted Sunny on the head. Well, all right, Violet said and gave her brother a wave as he followed the optometrist farther down the hallway. Violet and Sunny gave the door a push and went inside the waiting room and saw in an instant that Dr. Orwell was right. All was clear to them in a moment. 
The waiting room was a small one, and it looked like most waiting rooms. It had a sofa and a few chairs and a small table with old magazines stacked on it, and a receptionist sitting at a desk just like waiting rooms that you or I have been in. But when Violet and Sunny looked at the receptionist, they saw something that I hope you have never seen in a waiting room. A nameplate on the desk read Shirley, but this was no Shirley. Even though the receptionist was wearing a pale brown dress and sensible be beige shoes, for above the pale lipstick on Shirley's face and below the blonde wig on Shirley's head was a pair of shiny, shiny eyes that the two children recognized at once. Dr. Orwell, in behaving politely, had been the honey instead of the vinegar. The children, unfortunately, were the flies, and Count Olaf, sitting at the receptionist's desk with an evil smile, had caught them at last. End of chapter 8. Nice job keeping time with the brows. Thank you. You just realized it was an eye-shaped building, not an eye shape. <laughs> King Ramses. Way to neglect reading boring parts, class. That foreshadowing, though. This most nefarious plot was stark. <laughs> Guys, we should we need to rabbit um, the series of unfortunate events ser Netflix series together because now that uh, I'm almost done with the with book four and the first season goes through books one through four, so that's fun. All right, well, we're at 56 minutes, and I that is the chunk that I'm reading for today. The next uh, time that we get together to read, which will probably be, I don't know, Thursday night or Friday night, because um, I think Tuesday night I'm going to be doing Labyrinth of Lies, maybe, depending. Um, but anyway, next time we get together to read this, we'll finish the book up. We'll read chapters 9 through 13, um, which, is, which are the last five chapters. Thank you. Thank you for for in uh, complimenting the chunk of book. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be a very long stream tonight, but that's cool with me because I am a granny and it is getting closer to my bedtime. So I'm going to go wrap things up. I'm going to go get into my pajamas and I'm going to play some Pokemon Pie Cross until I go to sleep. <laughs> Um, so thank you guys so much for being here as always. Um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your weekend, the few hours that's left. Please take care of yourselves this week so that I can see you all back again soon. As always, much love from me to you and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.